Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's information session. My name is Dawn Monaco, and I am a senior trainer here at SPAN Parent Advocacy Network. I will be facilitating this session today, along with Deborah Jennings, who is our SPAN uh, Executive Co-Director, and Tatiana DeGrasa, who is a START EPSD Project Director. SPAN Parent Advocacy Network supports families as advocates and partners in improving education, health, and mental health outcomes for infants, toddlers, children, and youth. We help families to know their rights, access resources and information, and navigate systems that serve families across New Jersey. Our staff, including family resource specialists, parent group specialists, community health care workers, and others are available to support families, educators, and health professionals by phone and email. I invite you to call our warm line, 973-642-8100 for assistance and support. For today's session, all of our participants are on listen-only mode. Please be sure to monitor the chat box for any additional information and resources as we will be posting there. You can also use the chat for any assistance you might have. We also welcome your questions, so please share them in the chat box as well. Although your specific question may not be answered, we have a lot of people on today, so we may not get to all of your questions. We will be collecting them and, and we will be sharing them with state agencies and departments, and they will be uh, used for future presentations. A link to access the report that will be discussed today will be posted in the chat box as well. Video is being recorded and streamed um, to our Facebook page live. Um, it will also be uploaded to our SPAN YouTube page and it will be shared on our website um, and all of our social media platforms. I invite you to subscribe to our YouTube page as we do upload videos um, quite frequently and you can be notified when they are uploaded. Um, check the chat box and we will be indicating the YouTube page there. So first and foremost, I'd like to just say, I hope you and your families are all safe and we thank you for joining us today to hear the latest important information about the reopening of schools. I know everyone has a lot of questions around that. We recognize that this is challenging time for families and that they're uh, facing lots of different um, challenging circumstances in this uncertain time. And SPAN uh, is making every effort to bring you the most relevant and useful information. Our goal for today is to inform families about the guidance document called the Road Back, which has been issued by the New Jersey Department of Education. And we wanna share information regarding district activities and ways that parents can participate in this process. Today's session will be brief, but we hope that you will gain the information you need to take action and become involved in this important process. At this time, I would like to turn this over to Deborah Jennings. Welcome, Deborah, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Don, and welcome to all of you. As Don mentioned, um, this is um, some information that is in many ways hot off the press um, about how schools can and should reopen um, in September. Um, we probably, in a lot of ways, we probably have more questions than information as just as you do. Um, the plan was, um, was published. The plan is 104 pages and it is um, exactly, um, it is definitely a plan. It's not, um, it's not necessarily a regulatory, it's not regulatory information. In fact, um, I actually searched through the document to find out what it said in terms of requirements of districts. You know, what are the things that districts are required to do? And the only requirements are those related to uh, face coverings um, that there's that they in, in a number of places it mentions face covering. So what this says to us and it says and it should say to you is that these, this is some information that we all need to have in front of us. And in addition, that schools and districts really need to hear from you, hear from families, 
from community members about what would be the best road back for our children. Um, so what we, the um, report is organized around essentially four themes and we're gonna just mention a little bit about three of those themes. Uh, the first thing, theme is around conditions for learning. And when they're talking about conditions for learning, this is where we see a lot of the information about what needs to happen in terms of the general health and safety guidelines that schools should put into place. Um, these guidelines are related to most, really relate to the CDC guidelines and how schools are, should comply with or must comply with the CDC guidelines and their local and state health guidelines. So this is probably where we see the most in terms of what schools and districts are going to be required to do. Um, it also includes in conditions for learning, it also talks about social emotional learning and the school climate and culture. And what that means in terms of you know, we're, we're going to be re-engaging students and re-engaging adults and educators and other members of the school community back into these reopened schools. And so, you know, it's, we really need to be looking at what does this require in terms of social emotional learning and school climate. I mean, as when we, when we go back to school, it cannot all be about um, the academics. Um, because essentially um, these past months of uncertainty have created a lot of anxiety and some trauma for um, uh, children and also for the adults. Another piece that is talked about in Conditions for Learning is around what is called multi-tiered systems of support. And this is an uh, area where SPAN has provided a lot of workshops on what multi-tiered systems of supports should look like. And essentially it says that the school needs to have some processes and some procedures and some tools in place for determining what are the needs of students as they're coming back. What are the academic needs? What are the behavior needs of, of students? Ways to find out what those needs might be and then to put into place interventions and supports in order for students to be able to achieve and to grow and to develop in school um, and having those needs met. Um, it also talks about um, the conditions for learning also talk about wraparound supports um, and again about academic behavior and uh, social emotional supports. Um, and then we're looking at in terms of health and safety guidelines as well, food service and distribution. What are what is lunchtime going to look like? What are meals going to look like? How are we going to get meals to um, students who are who are um, um, who students who are able to take advantage of uh, free and reduced lunch, especially if there is another time when schools are closing? And then also about uh, what does quality childcare need to look like? Now, under the leadership and planning, that's where we really want you today to really be um, informed because under leadership and planning, the school districts are um, to, to organize two committees. And both of these committees in the plan, in the state plan, it is outlined that they should include parents and community members. And so what we are really recommending is that parents um, reach out to their school districts to find out about these committees and how they can participate. And not only in terms of participating as, mem in, as members, but also participating in ways that families, parents, and also students can provide feedback to these committees. Um, the restart committee, let me grab my notes. On there. So on the, the restart committee is exactly that. It's really the committee that has to put its, um, you know, really get into action right away. And many school districts have already started their restart committees because that committee has to have a plan in place for reopening schools. And that plan needs to be um, approved by the board and published 30 days prior to the beginning of the school year. 
So we're, we're talking about essentially a, the first week of August. And we are now in the sort of the first, second-ish week of July. So the timeline for this committee is very short. And that committee is to really outline um, some core areas about staffing, about scheduling what the school is going to need to do in order to make sure that social distancing is in place, um, addressing issues around face covering, um, and also uh, addressing issues around um, bringing back um, athletics and to what extent that may or may not happen. Um, there's actually some guidance from the New Jersey State Interscholastic Athletic Association about um, what schools can or should do as in terms of bringing back athletics and as you are you know, here in terms of what the state um, guidance and also the state requirements are, it's really very limited in terms of what sports need to be in place and how those need to be, um, how those need to be operated in this COVID-19 environment. The pandemic response team. Deborah, is, yes. May, may I ask a question? Sure. Regarding the restart committee, someone mm -hmm. is asking, um, is this is open to the public, correct? It's not just Board of Education members. Yeah, the committee should include, actually the committee should not just include Board of Education members. That restart committee should include educators, support staff representatives, administrative staff, you know, your principals, your, and of course your superintendent, and it should also include committee um, and community members and parents. Um, you know, the leadership of parent organization, in the district as well as other parent leaders. So that committee would not be just board members. But again, the, there is not a requirement in the plan that says that it has to be. It's more of what should be versus what must be. And that's the same thing with the pandemic response um, committee. And that committee is also should include parents and educators. Um, and that committee is really the committee that's gonna be in, involved in ongoing because they have to really make decisions about how the schools will, um, what happens if there's changes in the sort of the health and the, the spread of COVID-19 and what needs to happen when, they're, when those changes happen. Um, they should, the, again, the recommendation is that the members of the committee should be, there should be school teams and they should include a cross section of administrators, teachers, staff, and parents. Um, and that it should reflect the makeup of the community. Um, it could also be an existing crisis response team. Some schools have those in place. Um, and it does say that um, that committee is responsible for, first of all, overseeing the school's implementation of the reopening plan, particularly the health and safety measures. Secondly, amending that plan and uh, protocols if needed based on what's going on in terms of cor the coronavirus. Um, providing staff with support and training constantly looking at what the data is saying about um, what's happening in terms of the challenges related to COVID-19 about school climate, and also communicating with the school community on an ongoing basis, because we know that one of the biggest challenges that we all faced in March was that there was not sufficient communication or timely enough communication about what was happening. And really that committee should be the pathway for community, family, and student voices to inform decision-making around uh, COVID-19. Um, and then the last section that we're gonna talk about is the continuity of learning. And in that section of the plan, um, again, there are not any requirements that are beyond the current um, education regulations in the state, but they talk about um, they talk about the importance of equitable access and support for students 
with um, disabilities, for students who are English language learners, for students who are experiencing economic disadvantage, for students who are experiencing homelessness, and making sure that the, the districts have put into place plans for, make that for the continuity of learning of those populations of students who have the greatest needs. Um, there is also a lot about technology and making sure that districts know whether or not their students and their families have access to technology, that's the equipment as well as um, the internet. Um, and because we know that a lot of schools essentially sort of lost track of students and we're not able to um, get engage them in instruction. And then there's a lot of discussion about what instruction and instructional supports need to be in place in order to be able to move from what may be full, either, you know, either full, um, full in-person learning or a number of hybrid models where there are some combinations of in-person and, um, and um, online or remote and distance learning. So those are some of the key pieces, but there is, a, as you can imagine, it's a 104 page plan. There's a lot in that plan. And we really um, encourage you to get involved in the plan at your school. Um, Tatiana DeGrosa from our SPAN staff is gonna talk about how parents can be involved in the resources that we have available at SPAN for that involvement and also um, what kinds of things we should be looking at as parents. So I do have a couple of questions, Tatiana, and you let me know if this is gonna be covered and I'll hold off on it, but um, mm -hmm. a couple of them are, what if the district either ignores your request to be on a committee or doesn't want you on a committee? Do we really have any recourse with that? No. Uh, no, it's, again, the, the language is very, um, clear that these are recommendations and not requirements. Right, okay. Just, you know, everything says is basically should do this, should do that, but there is not anything that says that parents must be on the committee. Go ahead, Tatiana, why don't you go ahead and begin? Thank you, Dawn. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to join today's discussion and to speak about how families can get involved in shaping the school district's plans for restart and recovery. So my name is Tatiana DeGrosa and I'm a parent group specialist and a co-director of the Start Engaging Parents of Students with Disabilities in Schools project at SPAN. And this project is a partnership between the New Jersey Department of Education, Office of Special Education Programs and SPAN Parent Advocacy Network. The project offers information, training and resources uh, that support the engagement of families to improve outcomes for students including developing and sustaining special education parent advisory groups or CPAGs and other parent support groups in communities and school districts. Through workshops, webinars, regional meetings and parent leadership development activities we help parents and parent leaders to become informed and active participant in their child's education partner with educators and district leaders to, uh, in improving educational programs for students with disabilities, particularly in the area of um, inclusion and literacy, start and strengthen special education parent advisory groups and other parent groups, and increase effective family engagement to improve special education programs, policy, and practices in school districts and communities. Uh, we believe that parents play a critical role in partnering with schools to ensure successful outcomes for their children's learning and development. During the extended school closures due to COVID-19, parents already being their child's first teachers, caregivers, and providers assumed roles of educators, learning coaches, um, speech and language pathologists, principals, physical and occupational therapists, behavioralists and aides, and the list goes on and on, while still trying to work either remotely or outside of their homes or seeking work. If you ask any parent, they will probably say that they learned something new about themselves and their child's education during their remote learning. I know that I did. 
And many of them would also say that if they could, they would want to go back and do something differently about their approach to remote learning for their children. So now, uh, as we look to September and the new school year, parents can make sure to do just that. They can focus on those lessons learned and help shape the school district's reopening plans to incorporate diverse parents' input, address their concerns and challenges, and answer any specific questions they may have regarding their child's unique needs just like some of those questions that come up in the chat box um, that you ask during this live session. One of the first things that parent can do is to contact their child's school and ask to participate in the school reopening committee team or task force, um, both or either one of those that Deborah discussed, restart committee or pandemic response team. So as a parent of a child receiving special education and related services on June 26th, after Governor Murphy's announcement about the release of the New Jersey Department of Education guidance on school reopening, the road back, and the emphasis on convening a broad stakeholder representation on the Restart Committee at the local level. I emailed my, directors, my district's director of special education and requested that one or more representatives from the district CPAD be included on these committees. I should mention that I am a co-leader, one of the co-leaders of our CPAG, and I have a good relationship with our director of special education. Um, she forwarded my request to a designated staff person in the district, um, and in my district it is um, a principal to make uh, necessary arrangements. And I also followed up with an email or a phone call to the principals to further uh, to the principal to further um, confirm that a parent member of the CPAC will be serving on this committee. Our committee does not have officially um, a name yet, um, and in my district, we will start meeting virtually next week after this week's graduation ceremonies. If you are not personally serving on the school restart committee you should still contribute your ideas toward the development of the school plan for reopening. It is imperative for parents to provide input to their local CPAG, PTO or PTA, Family School Association, or any other group or organization in the school district that needs to hear and consider parental input. And input is any information or feedback um, on what worked or didn't work, um, sharing of concerns, hopes, challenges, worries, suggestions, and successful practices you believe um, essential to be considered by the Restart Committee as they discuss school reopening plans. If you're not sure if your dis district have a CPAC or don't know how to find one, I encourage you to um, visit our online directory of, of CPACs and other parent groups by county, and I will drop in um, a link in the chat box right now as I speak. So you can go ahead and do that. There we go. And um, our project over the past three months have uh, hosted and facilitated virtual countywide roundtables and regional speak out meetings to gather in feedback from parents, educated educators, related services staff, um, district leaders, and community members about their questions concerns and best practices related to school reopening. And we have compiled COVID-19 quick questions to ask before schools reopen quick guide that will be released shor shortly to guide meaningful discussions around four main areas, um, school, including school operations, um, school um, students and staff supports, instruction and remote learning and family engagement. And once released, this quick guide will be posted on our webpage, where you can also find other previously released quick guides. And uh, we'll also include the link in the chat box so you can go ahead and check them out. Here we go. If your district does not have an active parent group like a CPAD, you should contact the Start Engaging Parents of Students with Disabilities Project staff for assistance with getting one started in your school district or community. And to connect with our uh, with a parent group specialist in your region, you should also visit our webpage and uh, uh, click on the tab that says contact us. us. Also, we encourage you to review our project's materials to help you enhance your skills. 
um, knowledge and confidence in serving on decision making groups like three start committees that impact policy and procedures, practices and supports for all students and their families. On our webpage, um, you will also find a wealth of resources, including the CPAC guide, um, several supplemental quick reference guides, including how can parent groups use technology to strengthen family engagement, best practices for ensuring collaboration between CPAGs and boards of education, how can CPAGs build diverse family engagement and others, as well as serving on groups, webinar series, and additional resources. Um, if you can also subscribe to Span Parent Leadership eNews, find us on Facebook and Twitter, email or call us. Um, I would like to also invite you to a series of parent lunchroom conversations we're hosting in July. So uh, grab your lunch and join us and other parents across New Jersey in the virtual lunchroom at noon on July 15th, 22nd and 29th to share remote learning experiences receive information and resources and discuss how parents can get involved in the planning and decisions made around reopening schools for 2020-2021 school year. And to register for the parent lunchroom conversations, I will drop the link in the chat box so you can do that to reserve your spots. And um, I would like to encourage you to contact me, contact me any time with additional questions and if you need assistance with your group my contact information is listed um, on this slide Wonderful. thank you tatiana so much information i i do think it's such a stressful time for uh, mm -hmm. families and parents and it's important that they understand that you all are still here even during this virtual world we live in now you're still here to help them with everything they need help with so thank you so much um, did you, Deborah or Tatiana, you want to add anything else? I think that um, there's a few questions in the chat, and some of them I've tried to respond yes, to. Yes, I saw that. Chat. Thank you. Um, and I don't know if there were, if we, I don't know, I guess we don't have time for any more questions. No, we have as much time as you'd like. I mean, there's a question here that says, will the district's reopening plan be reviewed by the Department of Ed person or is it just approved by the local school board? Now you had said that they have to be approved and sent into the New Jersey DOE, correct? Yeah, so the, the DOE will, they have to submit the reports. I don't, I have not seen what the, DOE's role will be in, in, in approving the reports. Okay. Um, as I said, there's um, really very little in the plan about requirements. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, they, do, they just have to address certain areas. And I, I'm, I, would, I would be surprised if the department um, in addressing it did more than essentially asking the district to um, represent that they had addressed all of the questions that they are to address in the report. Um, I would, they would more than likely not actually go into the report, review every, every aspect of the report and say, this is good, this is not. Right. I mean, just think about it. We have um, over almost 700 school districts, if you include the charter schools. And um, so, I mean, I think that that, is probably not a task that they're going right. to take on. It's, I mean, it will be similar to most other plans that are submitted. It's just a series of check marks that the board, that the um, the district has to, where the district indicates whether or not they fulfilled the requirements in, in terms of the list of items that they need to include. So, um, that's that's where things are on that. Any other questions? I don't see anything here. Um, the only question that was on Facebook was the one that we answered, you answered where they said, what if they don't allow you to be on the committee? Um, there's really no recourse, you said. It's just not mandatory. You could continue to ask to be on it. But um, I would, as a parent, I would then um, be sure to ask those questions at you know, your virtual Board of, uh, board of Ed meetings and just try to get, get as involved as you can. I mean, yeah. there's only so much you can do if they 
don't want you there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there are several questions where people ask about essentially what their rights are um, under IDA and special education, um, the special education code. And it's very clear that none of your rights are waived because of what we're experiencing. And mm -hmm. so you will, I mean, many, many of us will have to essentially exercise our rights under IDA or under the state special ed code as it relates to our students, um, you know, through our students IEPs, through our students IHPs and section 504. And, you know, that it's, you know, it, it is, that is gonna be an additional um, burden on families. But again, if you have individual questions like that, definitely call Spans warm line, yeah. and we're fielding a lot of those questions, and we can help you in terms of navigating to get to the answers that you need. Um, the only uh, question that I see here, Deborah, is parents have concerns about face masks and their children, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and one to one support or one to one aids during this mm -hmm. time of social distancing. There's some concerns around that, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure we can answer those questions right now. No, no, we can't. And I think in terms of the students' face coverings, I mean, it seemed to say that students should be should be required again should be required to wear face coverings if social distancing is not possible. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, as we're learning more and more about the uh, coronavirus. We know that indoors, um, the you know the spread is much greater than outdoors, and that indoors uh, face coverings, if you're within a certain distance, are you know highly recommended, and I'm sure in the schools will be required. Okay. But so that, essentially, that students wouldn't have to students may, depending on how the schools do it, they could do it in a way that students are not required to wear face coverings all day. Right. You're gonna be required to wear them at different parts of the day. So as Deborah uh, mentioned and Tatiana as well, if you have more questions uh, or you wanna uh, help in uh, figuring out how to contact your district and have some of these conversations, be sure to reach out to them. They are here for you. Um, we are here for you. Um, so I want to thank Deborah and Tatiana today. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to share this information with everyone. Um, I offer my sincere thank you, and I'm sure everybody on today does as well. We have a very large group on, which is wonderful. I'm so glad that everyone was able to hear this information. This has uh, been recorded. It will be also up on our uh, YouTube page. Um, Thank you to the people who were able to be on for uh, Facebook. Thank you to the over 70 Zoom uh, members on here. Um, you can check out this recording, as I mentioned. We are here for you. We've been here for, me, for you from the beginning. Uh, we moved everything virtual so that we could continue to support everyone during this unprecedented time. So even though our offices are closed, we are available to respond to you um, via phone. So once again, the 800 number is 1-800-654-7726. If you have questions or you need assistance, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube channel um, and, uh, uh, so that you get notifications when new um, things are up. Um, again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Tatiana. Everyone, we wish nothing but health and safety to everyone out there and have a great day wonderful day. Thank you, Don.